crieth out of him, passion for power, the terrible teacher of great contempt, which preacheth to their face to cities and empires, away with thee, until a voice crieth out of themselves, away with me, passion for power, which, however, mounteth alluringly, even to the pure and lonesome, and up to self-satisfied elevations, glowing like a love that painteth purple felicities, alluringly on earthly heavens. Passion for power, but who would call it passion, when the height longeth to stoop for power? Verily, nothing sick or diseased is there in such longing and descending. That the lonesome height may not forever remain lonesome and self-sufficing, that the mountains may come to the valleys and the winds of the heights to the plains. Oh, who could find the right prenomen and honoring name for such longing, bestowing virtue? Thus did Zarathustra once name the unnameable. And then it happened also, and verily it happened for the first time, that his word blessed selfishness, the wholesome, healthy selfishness that spranget from the powerful soul, from the powerful soul to which the high body appertaineth, the handsome, triumphing, refreshing body around which everything becometh a mirror, the pliant, persuasive body, the dancer whose symbol and epitome is the self-enjoying soul. Of such bodies and souls the self-enjoyment calleth itself virtue. With its words of good and bad doth such self-enjoyment shelter itself as with sacred groves. With the names of its happiness doth it banish from itself everything contemptible. Away from itself doth it banish everything cowardly. It saith, bad that is cowardly. Contemptible seem to it the ever solicitous, the sighing, the complaining, and whoever pick up the most trifling advantage. It despiseth also the bitter-sweet wisdom, for verily there is also wisdom that bloometh in the dark, a nightshade wisdom, which ever sigheth, all is vain. Shy distrust is regarded by it as base, and every one who wanteth oaths instead of looks and hands, also all over distrustful wisdom, for such is the mode of cowardly souls. Baser still, it regardeth the obsequious, doggish ones, who immediately lieth on his back, the submissive one, and there is also wisdom that is submissive and doggish and pious and obsequious, hateful to it altogether, and a loathing is he who will never defend himself, he who swalloweth down poisonous spittle and bad looks, the all-too-patient one, the all-endurer, the all-satisfied one, for that is the mode of slaves. Whether they be servile before God and divine spurnings, or before men and stupid human opinions, at all kinds of slaves doth it spit this blessed selfishness. Bad thus doth it call all that is spirit-broken, and sordidly servile, constrained, blinking eyes, depressed hearts, and the false submissive style, which kisseth with broad cowardly lips, and spurious wisdom. So doth it call all the wit that slaves and hoary-headed and weary ones affect, and especially all the cunning, spurious-witted, curious-witted foolishness of priests. The spurious wise, however, all the priests, the world-weary, and those whose souls are of feminine and servile nature, oh, how hath their game all along abused selfishness, and precisely that was to be virtue, and was to be called virtue, to abuse selfishness and selfless. So did they wish themselves with good reason, all those world-weary cowards and cross spiders. But to all those cometh now the day, the change, the sword of judgment, the great noontide. Then shall many things be revealed, and he who proclaimeth the ego wholesome and holy, and selfishness blessed, verily he, the prognosticator, speaketh also what he knoweth. Behold, it cometh, it is nigh, the great noontide. Thus spake Zarathustra. 55. The Spirit of Gravity My mouthpiece is of the people. Too coarsely and cordially do I talk for angora rabbits. 
and still stranger soundeth my word unto all inkfish and pen foxes. My hand is a fool's hand, woe unto all tables and walls, and whatever hath room for fools sketching, fools scrawling. My foot is a horse foot, therewith do I trample and trot over stick and stone in the fields up and down, and am bedeviled with delight in all fast racing. My stomach is surely an eagle's stomach, for it prefereth lamb's flesh, certainly it is a bird's stomach, nourished with innocent things and with few, ready and impatient to fly, to fly away. That is now my nature. Why should there not be something of bird nature therein, and especially that I am hostile to spirit of gravity? That is bird nature. Verily, deadly, hostile, supremely hostile, originally hostile. Oh, whither hath my hostility not flown and misflown? Thereof could I sing a song, and will sing it, though I be alone in an empty house, and must sing it to mine own ears. Other singers there are, to be sure, to whom only the full house maketh the voice soft, the hand eloquent, the eye expressive, the heart wakeful. Those do I not resemble. He who one day teacheth men to fly will have shifted all landmarks. To him will all landmarks themselves fly into the air. The earth will he christened anew, as the light body. The ostrich runneth faster than the fastest horse, but it also thrusteth its head heavily into the heavy earth. Thus it is with the man who cannot yet fly. Heavy unto him are earth and life, and so willeth the spirit of gravity. But he who would become light and be a bird must love himself. Thus do I teach. Not, to be sure, with the love of the sick and infected, for with them stinketh even self-love. One must learn to love oneself. Thus do I teach, with a wholesome and healthy love, that one may endure to be with oneself and not go roving about. Such roving about christeneth itself brotherly love. With these words hath there hitherto been the best lying and disassembling, and especially by those who have been burdensome to everyone. And verily it is no commandment today and tomorrow to learn to love oneself. Rather is it of all arts the finest, subtlest, last, and patientest, for to its possessor is all possession well concealed, and of all treasure pits one's own is last excavated. So causeth the spirit of gravity. Almost in the cradle are we apportioned with heavy words and worths, good and evil. So calleth itself this dowry. For the sake of it we are forgiven for living, and therefore suffereth one little children to come unto one to forbid them bedtimes to love themselves. So causeth the spirit of gravity. And we, we bear loyally what is apportioned unto us, on hard shoulders, over rugged mountains. And when we sweat, then do people say to us, Yea, life is hard to bear. But man himself only is hard to bear. The reason thereof is that he carrieth too many extraneous things on his shoulders. Like the camel, kneeleth he down, and letteth himself be well laden, especially the strong load-bearing man in whom reverence resideth. Too many extraneous heavy words and worths loadeth he upon himself. Then seemeth life to him a desert. And verily, many a thing also that is our own is hard to bear, and many internal things in man are like the oyster, repulsive and slippery and hard to grasp, so that an elegant shell with elegant adornment must plead for them. But this art also must one learn, to have a shell and a fine appearance, and sagacious blindness. Again, it deceiveth about many things in man, that many a shell is poor and pitiable, and too much of a shell, much concealed goodness and power is never dreamt of, the choicest dainties find no tasters. Women know that. The choicest of them. A little fatter, a little leaner. Oh, how much fate is in so little. 
man is difficult to discover, and unto himself most difficult of all. Often lieth the spirit concerning the soul, so causeth the spirit of gravity. He, however, hath discovered himself who saith, This is my good and evil. Therewith hath he silenced the mole and the dwarf, who say, Good for all, evil for all. Verily, neither do I like those who call everything good, and this world the best of all. Those do I call the all-satisfied. All-satisfiedness, which knoweth how to taste everything. That is not the best taste. I honor the refractory, fastidious tongues and stomachs, which have learned to say I, and yea, and nay, to chew and digest everything. However, that is the genuine swine nature, ever to say yee That hath only the ass learnt, and those like it, deep yellow and hot red, so wanteth my taste. It mixeth blood with all colours. He, however, who whitewasheth his house, betrayeth unto me a whitewashed soul. With mummies, some fall in love, others with phantoms, both alike hostile to all flesh and blood. Oh, how repugnant are both to my taste, for I love blood. And there will I not reside and abide where every one spitteth and speweth. That is now my taste. Rather would I live amongst thieves and perjurers. Nobody carrieth gold in his mouth. Still more repugnant unto me, however, are all lickspittles. And the most repugnant animal of man that I found did I christen parasite. It would not love, and would yet live by love. Unhappy do I call all those who have only one choice, either to become evil beasts or evil beast tamers. Amongst such would I not build my tabernacle. Unhappy do I also call those who have ever to wait. They are repugnant to my taste. All the toll-gatherers and traders and kings and other land-keepers and shopkeepers. Verily, I learned waiting also, and thoroughly so, but only waiting for myself, and above all did I learn standing, and walking, and running, and leaping, and climbing, and dancing. This, however, is my teaching. He who wisheth one day to fly must first learn standing, and walking, and running, and climbing, and dancing. One doth not fly into flying. With rope ladders learned I to reach many a window. With nimble legs did I climb high masts. To sit on high masts of perception seemed to me no small bliss. To flicker like small flames on high masts, a small light, certainly, but a great comfort, to cast away sailors and shipwrecked ones. By diverse ways and wendings did I arrive at my truth. Not by one ladder did I mount to the height where mine eye roveth into my remoteness. And unwillingly only did I ask my way. That was always counter to my taste. Rather did I question and test the ways themselves. A testing and a questioning hath been all my traveling. And verily, one must also learn to answer such questioning. That, however, is my taste. Neither a good nor a bad taste, but my taste, of which I have no longer either shame or secrecy. This is now my way. Where is yours? Thus did I answer those who asked me the way. For the way, it doth not exist. Thus spake Zarathustra. 56. Old and New Tables Here do I sit and wait, old broken tables around me, and also new half-written tables. When cometh mine hour? The hour of my descent, of my down-going. For once more will I go unto men. For that hour do I now wait. For first must the signs come unto me that it is mine hour, namely the laughing lion with the flocks of doves. Meanwhile do I talk to myself as one who hath time. No one telleth me anything new, so I tell myself mine own story. When I came unto men, then found I them resting on an old infatuation. All of them thought they had long known what was good and bad for men. An old wearisome business seemed to them all discourse about virtue, 
and he who wished to sleep well spake of good and bad, ere retiring to rest. This somnolence did I disturb when I thought that no one yet knoweth what is good and bad, unless it be the creating one. It is he, however, who createth man's goal, and giveth to the earth its meaning and its future. He only effecteth it that, aught is good or bad. And I bade them upset their old academic chairs, and wherever that old infatuation had sat, I bade them laugh at their great moralists, their saints, their poets, and their saviors. At their gloomy sages did I bid them laugh, and whoever had sat admonishing as a black scarecrow on the tree of life. On their great grave highway did I seat myself, and even beside the carrion and vultures, and I laughed at all their bygone and its mellow decaying glory. Verily, like penitential preachers and fools did I cry wrath and shame on all their greatness and smallness. Oh, that their best is so very small. Oh, that their worst is so very small. Thus did I laugh. Thus did my wise longing, born in the mountains, cry and laugh in me, a wild wisdom. Verily, my great pinion rustling, longing. And oft did it carry me off and up and away, and in the midst of laughter. Then flew I quivering like an arrow with sun-intoxicated rapture, out into distant futures, which no dream hath yet seen, into warmer souths than ever sculptor conceived, where gods in their dancing are ashamed of all clothes, that I may speak in parables and halt and stammer like the poets, and verily I am ashamed that I have still to be a poet. Where all becoming seemed to me dancing of gods, and wantoning of gods, and the world unloosed and unbridled, and fleeing back to itself. As an eternal self-fleeing, and re-seeking of one another of many gods. As the blessed self-contradicting, re-communing, and re-fraternizing with one another of many gods. Where all time seemed to me a blessed mockery of moments where necessity was freedom itself, which played happily with the goad of freedom. Where I also found again mine old devil and arch enemy, the spirit of gravity and all that it created, constraint, law, necessity, and consequence, and purpose, and will, and good, and evil. For must there not be that which is danced over, danced beyond? Must there not, for the sake of the nimble, the nimblest be moles and clumsy dwarfs. There was it also where I picked up from the path the word Superman, and that man is something that must be surpassed. That man is a bridge and not a goal, rejoicing over his noontides and evenings as advances to new rosy dawns. The Zarathustra word of the great noontide and whatever else I have hung up over men like purple evening afterglows. Verily, also new stars did I make them see, along with new nights, and over cloud and day and night did I spread out laughter, like a gay-colored canopy. I taught them all my poetization and aspiration, to compose and collect into unity what is fragment in man, and riddle and fearful chance. As composer, riddle reader, and redeemer of chance, did I teach them to create the future, and all that hath been to redeem by creating. The past of man to redeem, and every it was to transform, until the will saith, but so did I will it, so shall I will it. This did I call redemption. This alone taught I them to call redemption. Now do I await my redemption, that I may go unto them for the last time. For once more will I go unto men, amongst them will my sun set. In dying will I give them my choicest gift. From the sun did I learn this, when it goeth down, the exuberant one. Gold doth it then pour into the sea, out of inexhaustible riches, so that the poorest fisherman roweth even with golden oars. For this did I once see, and did not tire of weeping and beholding it. Like the sun will also Zarathustra go down. Now sitteth he here, and waiteth old broken tables around him, and also new tables, 
half written. Behold, here is a new table, but where are my brethren who will carry it with me to the valley and into the hearts of flesh? Thus demandeth my great love to the remotest ones. Be not considerate of thy neighbor. Man is something that must be surpassed. There are many diverse ways and modes of surpassing. See thou thereto. But only a buffoon thinketh man can also be overlept. Surpass thyself even in thy neighbor, and a right which thou canst seize upon shalt thou not allow to be given thee. What thou doest can no one do to thee again. Lo, there is no requital. He who cannot command himself shall obey, and many a one can command himself, but still sorely lacketh self-obedience. Thus wisheth the type of noble souls. They desire to have nothing gratuitously, least of all life. He who is of the populace wisheth to live gratuitously. We others, however, to whom life hath given itself, we are ever considering what we can best give in return. And verily, it is a noble dictum which saith, What life promiseth us, that promise will we keep to life. One should not wish to enjoy where one doth not contribute to the enjoyment, and one should not wish to enjoy, for enjoyment and innocence are the most bashful things. Neither like to be sought for, one should have them, but one should rather seek for guilt and pain. O oh, my brethren, he who is a firstling is ever sacrificed. Now, however, we are firstlings. We all bleed on secret sacrificial altars. We all burn and broil in honor of ancient idols. Our best is still young. This exciteth old palates. Our flesh is tender. Our skin is only lamb's skin. How could we not excite old idol priests? In ourselves dwelleth he still, the old idol priests, who broileth our best for his banquet. Ah, my brethren, how could firstlings fail to be sacrifices? But so wisheth our type, and I love those who do not wish to preserve themselves. The downgoing ones do I love with mine entire love, for they go beyond. To be true, that can few be, and he who can will not, least of all, however, can the good be true. Oh, those good ones. Good men never speak the truth, for the spirit, thus to be good, is a malady. They yield, those good ones. They submit themselves, their heart repeateth, their soul obeyeth. He, however, who obeyeth, doth not listen to himself. All that is called evil by the good must come together in order that one truth may be born. Oh, my brethren, are ye also evil enough for this truth? The daring venture, the prolonged distrust, the cruel nay, the tedium, the cutting into the quick, how seldom do these come together. Out of such seed, however, is truth produced. Besides, the bad conscience hath hitherto grown all knowledge. Break up, break up, ye discerning ones, the old tables, when the water hath planks. When gangways and railings o'erspan the stream, verily, he is not believed who then saith, All is in flux. But even the simpletons contradict him. What? say the simpletons, all in flux? Planks and railings are still over the stream. Over the stream all is stable. All the values of things, the bridges and bearings, all good and evil, these are all stable. Cometh, however, the hard winter, the stream tamer. Then learn even the wittiest distrust, and verily, not only the simpletons then say, should not everything stand still? Fundamentally standeth everything still. That is an appropriate winter doctrine, good cheer for an unproductive period, a great comfort for winter sleepers and fireside and loungers. Fundamentally standeth everything still, but contrary thereto preacheth the thawing wind, the thawing wind, a bullock, which is no ploughing bullock, a furious bullock, a destroyer, which with angry horns breaketh the ice. The ice, however, breaketh gangways. O oh, my brethren, is not everything at present in flux? Have not all railings and gangways fallen into the water? Who would still hold on to good and evil? 
Woe to us! Hail to us! The thawing wind bloweth. Thus preach, my brethren, through all the streets. There is an old illusion. It is called good and evil. Around soothsayers and astrologers hath hitherto revolved the orbit of this illusion. Once did one believe in soothsayers and astrologers, and therefore did one believe everything is fate. Thou shalt, for thou must. Then again did one distrust all soothsayers and astrologers, and therefore did one believe everything is freedom, and thou canst, for thou willest. O my brethren, concerning the stars and the future, there hath hitherto been only illusion and not knowledge. And therefore, concerning good and evil, there hath hitherto been only illusion and not knowledge. Thou shalt not rob, thou shalt not slay. Such precepts were once called holy. Before them did one bow the knee and the head and take off one's shoe. But I ask you, where have there ever been better robbers and slayers in the world than such holy precepts? Is there not even in all life robbing and slaying? And for such precepts to be called holy, was not truth itself thereby slain? Or was it a sermon of death that called holy what contradicted and dissuaded from life? Oh, my brethren, break up, break up for me the old tables. It is my sympathy with all the past that I see it is abandoned. Abandoned to the flavor, the spirit, and the madness of every generation that cometh, and reinterpreteth all that hath been as its bridge. A great potentate might arise, an artful prodigy, who with approval and disapproval could strain and constrain all the past, until it became for him a bridge, a harbinger, a herald, and a cock-crowing. This, however, is the other danger, and mine other sympathy. He who is of the populace. His thoughts go back to his grandfather. With his grandfather, however, doth time cease. Thus is all the past abandoned, for it might some day happen for the populace to become master and drown all time in shallow waters. Therefore, O oh my brethren, a new nobility is needed, which shall be the adversary of all populace and potentate rule, and shall inscribe anew the word noble, on new tables, for many noble ones are needed, and many kinds of noble ones, for a new nobility, or as I once said in parable, that is just divinity, that there are gods, but no God. O oh, my brethren, I consecrate you, and point you to a new nobility. Ye shall become procreators, and cultivators, and sowers of the future. Verily, not to a nobility which ye could purchase like traders with traders' gold, for little worth is all that hath its price. Let it not be your honor henceforth whence ye came, but whither ye go. Your will and your feet will seek to surpass you. Let these be your new honor. Verily, not that ye have served a prince, of what account are princes now, nor that ye have become a bulwark to that which standeth that it may stand more firmly. Not that your family have become courtly at courts, and that ye have learned, gay-colored, like the flamingo, to stand long hours in shallow pools. For ability to stand is a merit in courtiers, and all courtiers believe that unto blessedness after their death pertaineth permission to sit. Not even that a spirit called holy led your forefathers into promised lands, which I do not praise, for where the worst of all trees grew, the cross, in that land there is nothing to praise. And verily, wherever this Holy Spirit led its knights, always in such campaigns did goats and geese and ryeheads and guyheads run foremost. O oh, my brethren, not backward shall your nobility gaze, but outward, Exile shall ye be from all fatherlands and forefatherlands. Your children's land shall ye love. Let this love be your new nobility, the undiscovered in the remotest seas. For it do I bid your sails search and search. Unto your children shall ye make amends for being the children of your fathers. All the past shall ye thus redeem. This new table do I place over you. Why should one live? All is vain. To live, that is to thrash straw. To live, that is to burn oneself and yet not get warm. 
such ancient babbling still passeth for wisdom, because it is old, however, and smelleth mustily. Therefore is it the more honored, even mold ennobleth. Children might thus speak, they shun the fire, because it hath burnt them. There is much childishness in the old books of wisdom. And he who ever thrasheth straw, why should he be allowed to rail at thrashing? Such a fool one would have to muzzle. Such persons sit down to the table and bring nothing with them, not even good hunger, and then do they rail, all is vain. But to eat and drink, well, my brethren, is verily no vain art. Break up, break up for me the tables of the never joyous ones. To the clean are all things clean. Thus say the people, I, however, say unto you, to the swine all things become swinish. Therefore preach the visionaries and bowed heads, whose hearts are also bowed down. The world itself is a filthy monster, for these are all unclean spirits, especially those, however, who have no peace or rest, unless they see the world from the backside, the backworldsman. To those do I say it to the face, although it sound unpleasantly, the world resembleth man, in that it hath a backside, so much is true. There is in the world much filth, so much is true, but the world itself is not therefore a filthy monster. There is wisdom in the fact that much in the world smelleth badly, loathing itself createth wings and fountain-dividing powers. In the best there is still something to loathe, and the best is still something that must be surpassed. Oh, my brethren, there is much wisdom in the fact that much filth is in the world. Such sayings did I hear pious back worldsmen speak to their consciences, and verily without wickedness or guile, although there is nothing more guileful in the world or more wicked. Let the world be as it is, raise not a finger against it. Let whoever will choke and stab and skin and scrape the people raise not a finger against it. Thereby will they learn to renounce the world. And thine own reason, this shalt thou thyself stifle and choke, for it is a reason of this world. Thereby wilt thou learn thyself to renounce the world. Shatter, shatter, O oh my brethren, those old tables of the pious. Tatter the maxims of the world maligners. He who learneth much unlearneth all violent cravings. That do people now whisper to one another in all the dark lanes. Wisdom wearieth, nothing is worth while, thou shalt not crave. This new table found I hanging even in the public markets. Break up for me, O brethren, break up also that new table, the weary, O the world. Put it up, and the preachers of death, and the jailer, for lo, it is also a sermon for slavery." because they learned badly and not the best, and everything too early and everything too fast, because they ate badly. From thence hath resulted their ruined stomach. For a ruined stomach is their spirit. It persuadeth to death. For verily, my brethren, the spirit is a stomach. Life is a well of delight. But to him in whom the ruined stomach speaketh, the father of affliction, all fountains are poisoned. To discern, that is, delight to the lion willed. But he who hath become weary is himself merely willed. With him play all the waves. And such is always the nature of weak men. They lose themselves on their way, and at last asketh their weariness. Why did we ever go on the way? All is indifferent. To them soundeth it pleasant to have preached in their ears. Nothing is worth while ye shall not will. That, however, is a sermon for slavery. O oh, my brethren, a fresh blustering wind cometh Zarathustra unto all way-weary ones. Many noses will he yet make sneeze. Even through walls bloweth my free breath, and in into prisons and imprisoned spirits. Willing emancipateth, for willing is creating. So do I teach, and only for creating shall ye learn, and also the learning shall ye learn only from me. He who hath ears, let him hear. There standeth the boat. Thither goeth it over, perhaps into vast nothingness. But who willeth to enter into this, perhaps? None of you want to enter into the death boat? How should ye then be world-weary ones, world-weary ones, and have not even withdrawn from the earth? 
Eager did I ever find you for the earth, amorous still of your own earth weariness. Not in vain doth your lip hang down. A small worldly wish still sitteth thereon, and in your eye floateth there not a cloudlet of unforgotten earthly bliss? There are on the earth many good inventions, some useful, some pleasant, for their sake is the earth to be loved. And many such good inventions are there, that they are like women's breasts, useful at the same time, and pleasant. Ye world-weary ones, however, ye earth idlers, you shall one beat with stripes. With stripes shall one again make you sprightly limbs. For if ye be not invalids or decrepit creatures of whom the earth is weary, then are ye sly sloths or dainty, sneaking pleasure cats. And if ye will not again run gaily, then shall ye pass away. To the incurable shall one not seek to be a physician. Thus teacheth Zarathustra. So shall ye pass away. But more courage is needed to make an end than to make a new verse, that do all physicians and poets know well. Oh, my brethren, there are tables which weariness framed, and tables which slothfulness framed, corrupt slothfulness. Although they speak similarly, they want to be heard differently. See this languishing one, only a span breadth is he from his goal. But from weariness hath he lain down obstinately in the dust, this brave one. From weariness yawneth he at the path, at the earth, at the goal, and at himself. Not a step further will he go, this brave one. Now gloweth the sun upon him, and the dogs lick at his sweat. But he lieth there in his obstinacy, and prefereth to languish. A span breadth from his goal to languish. Verily, ye will have to drag him into his heaven by the hair of his head, this hero. Better still, that ye let him lie where he hath lain down, that sleep may come unto him, the comforter with cooling patter rain. Let him lie until of his own accord he awakeneth, until of his own accord he repudiateth all weariness, and what weariness hath taught through him. Only, my brethren, See that ye scare the dogs away from him, the idle skulkers, and all the swarming vermin, all the swarming vermin of the cultured that feast on the sweat of every hero. I form circles around me in holy boundaries. Ever fewer ascend with me, ever higher mountains. I build a mountain range out of ever holier mountains. But wherever ye would ascend with me, O oh brethren, take care lest a parasite ascend with you, a parasite that is a reptile, a creeping, cringing reptile that trieth to fatten on your infirm and sore places. And this is its art. It divineth where ascending souls are weary, in your trouble and dejection, in your sensitive modesty, doth it build its loathsome nest, where the strong are weak, where the noble are all too gentle. There buildeth it its loathsome nest. The parasite liveth where the great have small, sore places. What is the highest of all species of being, and what is the lowest? The parasite is the lowest species. He, however, who is of the highest species, feedeth most parasites. For the soul which hath the longest ladder, and can go deepest down, how could there fail to be more parasites upon it? The most comprehensive soul, which can run and stray and rove furthest in itself, the most necessary soul, which out of joy flingeth itself into chance. The soul in being, which plungeth into becoming. The possessing soul, which seeketh to attain desire and longing. The soul fleeing from itself, which overtaketh itself in the wildest circuit. The wisest soul, unto which folly speaketh most sweetly. The soul most self-loving, in which all things have their current and counter-current, their ebb and their flow. Oh, how could the loftiest soul fail to have the worst parasites? Oh, my brethren, am I then cruel? But I say, what falleth that shall one also push? Everything of today, it falleth, it decayeth. Who would preserve it? But I, I wish also to push it. Know ye the delight which rolleth stones into perceptuous depths? Those men of today, 
See just how they roll into my depths. A prelude am I to better players. O brethren, an example. Do according to mine example. And him who ye do not teach to fly, teach, I pray you, to fall faster. I love the brave, but it is not enough to be a swordsman. One must also know whereon to use swordsmanship. And often it is greater bravery to keep quiet and pass by, that thereby one may reserve oneself for a worthier foe. Ye shall only have foes to be hated, but not foes to be despised. Ye must be proud of your foes. Thus have I already taught. For the worthier foe, O my brethren, shall ye reserve yourselves. Therefore must ye pass by many a one, especially many of the rabble, who din your ears with noise about people and peoples. Keep your eye clear of their for and against. There is there much right, much wrong. He who looketh on becometh wroth. Therein viewing, therein hewing. They are the same thing. Therefore depart into the forest and lay your sword to sleep. Go your ways, and let the people and peoples go theirs. Gloomy ways, verily, on which not a single hope glinteth any more. Let there the traitor rule, for all that still glittereth is traitor's gold. It is the time of kings no longer. That which now calleth itself the people is unworthy of kings. See how these people themselves now do just like the traitors. They pick up the smallest advantage out of all kinds of rubbish. They lay lures for one another. They lure things out of one another. That they call good neighborliness. Oh, blessed remote period when a people said to itself, I will be master over peoples. For, my brethren, the best shall rule. The best also willeth to rule. And where the teaching is different, there the best is lacking. If they had bread for nothing, alas, for what would they cry? Their maintainment, that is their true entertainment, and they shall have it hard. Beasts of prey are they in their working. There is even plundering in their earning. There is even overreaching, therefore shall they have it hard. Better beasts of prey shall they thus become, subtler, cleverer, more manlike, for man is the best beast of prey. That is why of all animals it hath been hardest for man. Only the birds are still beyond him. And if man should yet learn to fly, alas, to what height would his rapacity fly? Thus would I have man and woman fit for war. The one fit for maternity, the other. Both, however, fit for dancing, with head and legs. And lost be the day to us, in which a measure hath not been danced, and false be every truth which hath not had laughter along with it. Your marriage arranging, see that it be not a bad arranging. Ye have arranged too hastily, so there floweth therefrom marriage breaking. And better marriage breaking than marriage bending, marriage lying. Thus spake a woman unto me. Indeed I broke the marriage, but first did the marriage break me. The badly paired found I ever the most revengeful. They make everyone suffer for it, that they no longer run singly. On that account, want I the honest ones to say to one another, We love each other. Let us see to it that we maintain our love, or shall our pledging be blundering? Give us a set term and a small marriage, that we may see if we are fit for the great marriage. It is a great matter always to be twain. Thus do I counsel all honest ones, and what would be my love to the superman, and to all that is to come, if I should counsel and speak otherwise, not only to propagate yourself onwards, but upwards. There too, oh, my brethren, may the garden of marriage help you. He who hath grown wise concerning old origins, lo, he will at last seek after the fountains of the future and new origins. Oh, my brethren, not long will it be until new peoples shall arise and new fountains shall rush down into new depths. For the earthquake, it choketh up many wells, it causeth much languishing, but it bringeth also to light inner powers and secrets. The earthquake discloseth new fountains. In the earthquake of old peoples, new fountains burst 
forth. And whoever calleth out, Lo, here is a well for many thirsty ones, one heart for many longing ones, one will for many instruments. Around him collecteth the people, that is to say, many, the tempting ones, who can command, who must obey. That is there attempted. Ugh, with what long seeking and solving and failing and learning and re-attempting. Human society, it is an attempt, so I teach, a long seeking. It seeketh, however, the ruler. An attempt, my brethren, and no contract. Destroy, I pray you, destroy the world of the soft-hearted and half and half. Oh, my brethren, with whom lieth the greatest danger to the whole human future? Is it not with the good and just? As though who say and feel in their hearts, we already know what is good and just, we possess it also. Woe to those who still seek thereafter. And whatever harm the wicked may do, the harm of the good is the harmfulest harm. And whatever harm the world maligners may do, the harm of the good is the harmfulest harm. Oh, my brethren, into the hearts of the good and just looked someone once on a time, who said, they are the Frises, but people did not understand them. The good and just themselves were not free to understand him. Their spirit was imprisoned in their good conscience. The stupidity of the good is unfathomably wise. It is the truth, however, that the good must be Pharisees. They have no choice. The good must crucify him who deviseth his own virtue. That is the truth. The second one, however, who discovered their country, the country, heart and soil of the good and just. It was he who also asked, Whom do they hate most? The Creator? Hate they most? Him who breaketh the tables and old values? The Breaker? Him they call the lawbreaker? For the good they cannot create. They are always the beginning of the end. They crucify him who writeth new values on new tables. They sacrifice unto themselves the future. They crucify the whole human future. The good, they have always been the beginning of the end. Oh, my brethren, have you also understood this word and what I once said of the last man? With whom lieth the greatest danger to the whole human future? It is not with the good and just? Break up, break up, I pray you, the good and just. Oh, my brethren, have ye understood also this word? Ye flee from me, ye are frightened, ye tremble at this word? Oh, my brethren, when I enjoined you to break up the good and the tables of the good, then only did I embark man on his high seas. And now only cometh unto him the great terror, the great outlook, the great sickness, the great nausea, the great sea sickness. False shores and false securities did the good teach you. In the lies of the good were ye born and bred. Everything hath been radically contorted and distorted by the good. But he who discovered the country of man discovered also the country of man's future. Now shall ye be sailors for me, brave, patient. Keep yourselves up, bedtime, my brethren. Learn to keep yourselves up. The sea stormeth. Many seek to raise themselves again by you. The sea stormeth. All is in the sea. Well, cheer up, ye old seamen hearts. What of fatherland? Thither striveth our helm, where our children's land is. Thitherwards, stormier than the sea, stormeth our great longing. Why so hard? said to the diamond one day, the charcoal. Are we then not near relatives? Why so soft, O oh, my brethren? Thus do I ask you. Are ye not then my brethren? Why so soft, so submissive and yielding? Why is there so much negation and abnegation in your hearts? Why is there so little fate in your looks? And if ye will not be fates and inexorable ones, how can ye one day conquer with me? And if your hardness will not glance and cut and chip to pieces, how can ye one day create with me? For the creators are hard, and blessedness must it seem to you to press your hand upon millenniums as upon wax, blessedness to write upon the will of millenniums as upon brass, harder than brass, nobler than brass. Entirely hard is only the noblest. This new table, oh my brethren, put I up over you, Become hard. O oh, thou, my will, thou change of every need, my 
needfulness. Preserve me from all small victories, thou fatedness of my soul, which I call fate. Thou in me, over me, preserve and spare me for one great fate, and thy last greatness, my will, spare it for thy last, that thou mayest be inexorable in thy victory. Ah, who hath not succumbed to his victory? Ah, whose eye hath not bedimmed in this intoxicated twilight? Ah, whose foot hath not faltered and forgotten in victory? How to stand, that I may one day be ready and ripe in the great noontide, ready and ripe like the glowing ore, the lightning-bearing cloud, and the swelling milk udder, ready for myself and for my most hidden will, a bow eager for its arrow, an arrow eager for its star. A star, ready and ripe in its noontide, glowing, pierced, blessed by annihilating sun arrows. A sun itself, and an inexorable sun will, ready for annihilation and victory. Oh, will thou change of every need my needfulness. Spare me for one great victory. Thus spake Zarathustra. 57. The Convalescent One morning... Not long after his return to his cave, Zarathustra sprang up from his couch like a madman, crying with a frightful voice and acting as if someone still lay on the couch who did not wish to rise. Zarathustra's voice also resounded in such a manner that his animals came to him, frightened. And out of all the neighboring caves and lurking places, all the creatures slipped away, flying, fluttering, creeping, or leaping, according to their variety of foot or wing. Zarathustra, however, spake these words. Up, abysmal thought, out of my depth. I am thy cock and morning dawn, thou overslept reptile. Up, up, my voice shall soon crow thee awake. Unbind the fetters of thine ears. Listen, for I wish to hear thee. Up, there is thunder enough to make the very graves listen. And rub the sleep and all the dimness and blindness out of thine eyes. Hear me also with thine eyes. My voice is a medicine even for those born blind. And once thou art awake, then shalt thou ever remain awake. It is not my custom to awake great-grandmothers out of their sleep that I may bid them sleep on. Thou stirrest, stretchest thyself, wheezest. Up, up, not wheeze shalt thou, but speak unto me. Zarathustra calleth thee, Zarathustra the godless. I, Zarathustra, the advocate of living, the advocate of suffering, the advocate of circuit, thee do I call my most abysmal thought. Joy to me, thou comest, I hear thee, mine abyss speaketh, my lowest depth have I turned over into the light. Joy to me, come hither, give me thy hand. Ha, let be, ha, disgust, disgust, disgust. Alas, to me. Hardly, however, had Zarathustra spoken these words when he fell down as one dead, and remained long as one dead. When, however, he again came to himself, then was he pale and trembling, and remained lying, and for long he would neither eat nor drink. This condition continued for seven days. His animals, however, did not leave him day nor night, except that the eagle flew forth to fetch food, and what it fetched and foraged, it laid on Zarathustra's couch, so that Zarathustra at last lay among yellow and red berries, grapes, rosy apples, sweet-smelling herbage, and pine cones. At his feet, however, two lambs were stretched, which the eagle had with difficulty carried off from their shepherd. At last, after seven days, Zarathustra raised himself upon his couch, took a rosy apple in his hand, smelt it, and found its smell pleasant. Then did his animals think the time had come to speak unto him. O oh, Zarathustra, said they, now hast thou lain thus for seven days with heavy eyes. Wilt thou not set thyself again upon thy feet? Step out of thy cave, the world waiteth for thee as a garden. The wind playeth with heavy fragrance, which seeketh for thee, and all brooks would like to run after thee. All things long for thee, since thou hast remained alone for seven days. Step forth out of thy cave. All things want to be thy physician. 
Did perhaps a new knowledge come to thee? A bitter, grievous knowledge? Like leavened dough layest thou, thy soul arose and swelled beyond all its bounds. Oh, mine animals, answered Zarathustra, talk on thus and let me listen. It refresheth me so to hear your talk. Where there is talk, there is the world as a garden unto me. How charming it is that there are words and tones, or not words and tones, rainbows and seeming bridges twixt the eternally separated. To each soul belongeth another world. To each soul is every other soul a back world. Among the most alike doth semblance deceive most delightfully, for the smallest gap is most difficult to bridge over. For me, how could there be an outside of me? There is no outside, but this we forget on hearing tones. How delightful it is that we forget. Have not names and tones been given unto things that man may refresh himself with them? It is a beautiful folly, speaking. Therewith danceth man over everything. How lovely is all speech and all falsehoods of tones. With tones danceth our love on variegated rainbows. O oh, Zarathustra, said then his animals, to those who think like us, things all dance themselves. They come and hold out the hand and laugh and flee and return. Everything goeth, everything returneth, eternally rolleth the wheel of existence. Everything dieth, everything blossometh forth again, eternally runneth on the year of existence. Everything breaketh, everything is integrated anew, eternally buildeth itself the same house of existence. All things separate, all things again greet one another, eternally true to itself remaineth the ring of existence. Every moment beginneth existence, around every here rolleth the ball there, the middle is everywhere, crooked is the path of eternity. O oh, ye wags and barrel organs, answered Zarathustra and smiled once more, how well do ye know what had to be fulfilled in seven days, and how that monster crept into my throat and choked me, but I bit off its head and spat it away from me, and ye, ye have made a liar lay out of it. Now, however, do I lie here, still exhausted with that biting and spitting away, still sick with mine own salvation, and ye looked on it all? Oh, mine animals, are ye all so cruel? Did ye like to look at my great pain as men do? For man is the cruelest animal. At tragedies, bullfights, and crucifixions hath he hitherto been happiest on earth. And when he invented his hell, behold, that was his heaven on earth. When the great man crieth, immediately runneth the little man thither and his tongue hangeth out of his mouth for very lusting. He, however, calleth it his pity. The little man, especially the poet, how passionately doth he accuse life in words. Hearken to him, but do not fail to hear the delight which is in all accusation. Such accusers of life, them life overcometh with the glance of the eye. Thou lovest me? saith the insolent one. Wait a little as yet I have no time for thee. Towards himself, man is the cruelest animal, and in all who call themselves sinners and bearers of the cross and penitents do not overlook the voluptuousness in their plaints and accusations. And I myself, do I thereby want to be man's accuser? Ah, mine animals, this only have I learned hitherto, that for man his baddest is necessary for his best, that all that is baddest is the best power and the hardest stone for the highest creator and that the man must become better and badder not to this torture stake was i tied that i know man is bad but i cried as no one hath yet cried ah that his baddest is so very small ah that his best is so very small the great disgust at men it strangled me, and had crept into my throat, and what the soothsayer had presaged, all is alike, nothing is worth while, knowledge strangleth. A long twilight limped on before me, a fatally weary, fatally intoxicated sadness. 
which spake with yawning mouth. Eternally he returneth, the man of whom thou art weary, the small man, so yawned my sadness, and dragged its foot, and could not go to sleep. A cavern became the human earth to me, its breast caved in, everything living became to me human dust and bones, and moldering past. My sighing sat on all human graves, and could no longer arise. My sighing and questioning croaked and choked, and gnawed and nagged day and night. Ah, oh, man returneth eternally, the small man returneth eternally. Naked had I once seen both of them, the greatest man and the smallest man, all too like one another, all too human, even the greatest man. All too small, even the greatest man. That was my disgust at man, and the eternal return also of the smallest man. That was my disgust at all existence. Ah, oh, disgust, disgust, disgust. Thus spake Zarathustra, and sighed, and shuddered. For he remembered his sickness. Oh, yeah. Then did his animals prevent him from speaking further. Do not speak further, thou convalescent! So answered his animals. But go out where the world rideth for thee like a garden. Go out unto the roses, the bees, and the flocks of doves, especially, however, unto the singing birds, to learn singing from them. For singing is for the convalescent. The sound ones may talk, and when the sound also wants songs, they want they other songs than the convalescent. O oh, ye wags and barrel organs, do be silent answered Zarathustra, and smiled at his animals. How well ye know what consolation I devised for myself in seven days, that I have to sing once more. That consolation that I devised for myself, and this convalescence. Would ye also make another lyre lay thereof? Do not talk further, answered his animals once more. Rather thou convalescent, prepare for thyself first a lyre, a new lyre. For behold, O Zarathustra, for thy new lays, there are needed new liars. Sing and bubble over, O Zarathustra, heal thy soul with new lays, that thou mayest bear thy great fate, which hath not yet been any one's fate. For thine animals know it well, O Zarathustra, who thou art, and must become. Behold, thou art the teacher of the eternal return. That is now thy fate, that thou must be the first to teach this teaching. How could this great fate not be thy greatest danger and infirmity? Behold, we know what thou teachest, that all things eternally return, and ourselves with them, and that we have already existed times without number, and all things with us. Thou teachest that there is a great year of becoming, a prodigy of a great year. It must, like a sand glass, ever turn up anew, that it may anew run down and run out, so that all those years are like one another in the greatest and also the smallest, so that we ourselves in every great year are like ourselves in the greatest and also in the smallest. And if thou wouldst now die, O Zarathustra, behold, we know also how thou wouldst then speak to thyself. But thine animals beseech thee, not to die yet. Thou wouldst speak, and without trembling, buoyant rather with bliss, for a great weight and worry would be taken from thee, thou patientest one. Now do I die and disappear, wouldst thou say, and in a moment I am nothing. Souls are as mortal as bodies, but the plexus of causes returneth in which I am intertwined. It will again create me. I myself pertain to the causes of the eternal return. I come again with this sun, with this earth, with this eagle, with this serpent, not to a new life, or a better life, or a similar life. I come again eternally to this identical and self-same life, in its greatest and its smallest, to teach again the eternal return of all things to speak again the word of the great noontide of earth and man, to announce again to man the superman. I have spoken my word, I break down by my word, so willeth mine eternal fate. As announcer do I succumb. The hour hath now come for the downgoer to bless himself. Thus endeth Zarathustra's downgoing. When the animals had spoken these words, 
They were silent and waited so that Zarathustra might say something to them. But Zarathustra did not hear that they were silent. On the contrary, he lay quietly with closed eyes, like a person sleeping, although he did not sleep, for he communed just then with his soul. The serpent, however, and the eagle, when they found him silent in such wise, respected the great stillness around him, and prudently retired. 58. The Great Longing Oh, my soul, I have taught thee to say, today, as once on a time, and formerly, and to dance thy measure over every here and there and yonder. Oh, my soul, I delivered thee from all by places. I brushed down from thee dust and spiders and twilight. Oh, my soul, I washed the petty shame and the by-place virtue from thee, and persuaded thee to stand naked before the eyes of the sun. With the storm that is called spirit, did I blow over thy surging sea. All clouds did I blow away from it. I strangled even the strangler called sin. Oh, my soul, I gave thee the right to say nay, like the storm, and to say yea, as the open heaven saith yea, calm as the light remainest thou, and now walkest through denying storms. O oh, my soul, I restored to thee liberty over the created and the uncreated, and who knoweth as thou knowest the voluptuousness of the future? O oh, my soul, I taught thee the contempt which doth not come like worm-eating, the great loving contempt, which loveth most where it contempteth most. O oh, my soul, I taught thee so to persuade that thou persuadest even the grounds themselves to thee, like the sun which persuadeth even the sea to its height. O oh, my soul, I have taken from thee all obeying, and knee-bending, and homage-paying. I have myself given thee the names Change of Need and Fate. O oh, my soul, I have given thee new names, and gay-colored playthings. I have called thee Fate, and the Circuit of Circuits, and the Naval String of Time, and the Azure Bell. O oh, my soul, to thy domain gave I all wisdom to drink. All new wines, and also immemorially old, strong wines of wisdom. O oh, my soul, every sun shed I upon thee, and every night, and every silence, and every longing. Then grewest thou up for me as a vine. O oh, my soul, exuberant and heavy dost thou now stand forth, a vine with swelling udders and full clusters of brown, golden grapes, filled and weighted by thy happiness waiting from superabundance, and yet ashamed of thy waiting. O oh, my soul, there is nowhere a soul which could be more loving, and more comprehensive, and more extensive. Where could future and past be closer together than with thee? O oh, my soul, I have given thee everything, and all my hands have become empty by thee. And now, sayest thou to me, smiling and full of melancholy, which of us oweth thanks? Doth the giver not owe thanks, because the receiver received? Is bestowing not a necessity? Is receiving not pitying? O oh, my soul, I understand the smiling of thy melancholy. Thine overabundance itself now stretcheth out longing hands. Thy fullness looketh forth over raging seas, and seeketh and waiteth. The longing of overfulness looketh forth from the smiling heaven of thine eyes. And verily, O oh, my soul, who could see thy smiling and not melt into tears? The angels themselves melt into tears through the over-graciousness of thy smiling. Thy graciousness and over-graciousness is it which will not complain and weep. And yet, O oh my soul, longeth thy smiling for tears and thy trembling mouth for sobs. Is not all weeping complaining and all complaining accusing? Thus speakest thou to thyself, and therefore... O oh, my soul, wilt thou rather smile than pour forth thy grief? Forth all thy grief concerning thy fullness, and concerning the craving of the vine for the vintager and vintage knife. But wilt thou not weep? Wilt thou not weep forth thy purple melancholy? Then wilt thou have to sing, O oh, my soul? Behold, I smile myself, who foretell thee this. Thou wilt have to sing with passionate song, until all seas turn calm to hearken unto thy longing, until over calm longing seas the bark 
glideth. The golden marvel around the gold of which all good, bad, and marvelous things frisk. Also many large and small animals, and everything that hath light marvelous feet, so that it can run on violet-blue paths towards the golden marvel, the spontaneous bark and its master. He, however, is the vintager who waiteth with the diamond vintage knife, thy great deliverer, O my soul, the nameless one, for whom future songs only will find names, and verily already hath thy breath the fragrance of future songs. Already glowest thou and dreamest, already drinkest thou thirstily at all deep echoing wells of consolation. Already reposeth thy melancholy in the bliss of future songs. O my soul, now have I given thee all, and even my last possession, and all my hands have become empty by thee. That I bade thee sing, behold, that was my last thing to give. That I bade thee sing, say now, say, which of us now oweth thanks? Better still, however, sing unto me, sing, O my soul, and let me thank thee. Thus spake Zarathustra. 59. The Second Dance Song Into thine eyes gazed I lately, O life. Gold saw I gleam in thy night eyes. My heart stood still with delight. A golden bark saw I gleam on darkened waters, a sinking, drinking, re-blinking, golden swing bark. At my dance frantic foot Dost thou questioning, melting, thrown glance? Twice only movedst thou thy rattle with thy little hands. Then did my feet swing with dance fury. My heels reared aloft, my toes they hearkened. Thee they would know. Hath not the dancer his ear and his toe? Unto thee did I spring. Then fledst thou back from my bound, and towards me waved thy fleeing, flying tresses round. Away from thee did I spring, and from thy snake tresses, then stoodst thou there half-turned, and in thine eye caresses. With crooked glances dost thou teach me crooked courses, on crooked courses lean my feet, crafty fancies. I fear thee near, I love thee far, thy flight allureth me, thy seeking secureth me. I suffer, but for thee, what would I not gladly bear? For thee, whose coldness inflameth, whose hatred misleadeth, whose flight enchaineth, whose mockery pleadeth. Who would not hate thee, thou great bindress, entwindress, temptress, secress, findress? Who would not love thee, thou innocent, impatient, wind-swift, child-eyed sinner? Whither pullest thou me now? thou paragon and tomboy, and now foolest thou me feeling, thou sweet rob dost annoy. I dance after thee, I follow even faint traces lonely. Where art thou? Give me thy hand, or thy finger only. Here are caves and thickets, we shall go astray. Halt, stand still, seest thou not owls and bats in fluttering fray? Thou bat, thou owl, thou wouldst play me foul? Where are we? From the dogs hast thou learned thus to bark and howl. Thou gnashest on me sweetly with little white teeth. Thine evil eyes shoot out upon me, thy curly little mane from underneath. This is a dance over stock and stone. I am the hunter. Wilt thou be my hound or my shamio anon? Now beside me, and quickly, wickedly springing, now up and over, alas! I have fallen myself over swinging. Oh, see me laying, thou arrogant one, and imploring grace. Gladly would I walk with thee in some lovelier place. In the paths of love, through bushes variegated, quiet, trim, or there along the lake, where gold fishes dance and swim. Thou art now aweary? There above are sheep and sunset stripes. It is not sweet to sleep, the shepherd pipes. Thou art so very weary? I carry thee thither, and art thou thirsty? I should have something, but thy mouth would not like it to drink. Oh, that cursed, nimble, supple serpent, and lurking witch, where art thou gone? But in my face do I feel, though thy hand, two spots and red blotches itch. I am verily weary of it, ever thy sheepish shepherd to be, thou witch, 
if I have hitherto sung unto thee, now shalt thou cry unto me. To the rhythm of my whip shalt thou dance and cry. I forgot not my whip, not I. Then did life answer me thus, and kept thereby her fine ears closed. O oh, Zarathustra, crack not so terribly with thy whip. Thou knowest surely that noise killeth thought. And just now there came to me such delicate thoughts. We are both of genuine ne'er-do-wells and ne'er-do-ills. Beyond good and evil found we our island and our green meadow. We two alone, therefore, must we be friendly to each other. And even should we not love each other from the bottom of our hearts, must we then have a grudge against each other if we do not love each other perfectly? And that I am friendly to thee, and often too friendly, that knowest thou, and the reason is that I am envious of thy wisdom. Ah, this mad old fool, wisdom! If thy wisdom should one day run away from thee, ha, then would also my love run away from thee quickly. Thereupon did life look thoughtfully behind and around, and said softly, O oh, Zarathustra, thou art not faithful enough to me. Thou lovest me not nearly so much as thou sayest. I know thou thinkest of soon leaving me. There is an old, heavy, heavy, booming clock. It boometh by night up thy cave. Hearest this clock strike the hours at midnight, then thinkest thou between one and twelve thereon. Thou thinkest thereon, O Zarathustra, I know it, of soon leaving me. Yea, answered I hesitatingly, but thou knowest it also. And I said something into her ear, and amongst her confused yellow foolish tresses. Thou knowest that, Zarathustra? That knoweth no one. And we gazed at each other, and looked at the green meadow, o'er which the cool evening was just passing, and we wept together. Then, however, was life dearer unto me than all my wisdom had ever been. Thus spake Zarathustra. One. One man take heed. Two. What saith deep midnight's voice indeed? Three. I slept my sleep. Four. From deepest dream. Five. The world is deep. Six. And deeper than the day could read. Seven. Deep is its woe. Eight. Joy. Deeper still than grief can be. Nine. Woe saith. Hence. Go. Ten. But joys all want eternity. Eleven. Want deep, profound eternity. Twelve. Sixty. The seven seals, or the yea and amen lay. If I be a diviner, and full of the divining spirit, which wandereth on high mountain ridges, twixt two seas, wandereth twixt the past and the future as a heavy cloud, hostile to sultry plains, and to all that is weary, and can neither die nor live, ready for lightning in its dark bosom and for the redeeming flash of light, charged with lightnings which say, Yea, which laugh, yea, ready for divining flashes of lightning. Blessed, however, is he who is thus charged, and verily, long must he hang like a heavy temptress on the mountain, who shall one day kindle the light of the future. Oh, how could I not be ardent for eternity, and for the marriage ring of rings, and the ring of the return? Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman whom I love, for I love thee, O eternity. For I love thee, O eternity. If ever my wrath hath burst graves, shifted landmarks, or rolled old shattered tables into perceptuous depths, if ever my scorn hath scattered moldered words to the winds, and if I have come like a besom, to cross spiders, and as a cleansing wind to old charnel houses. If ever I have sat rejoicing where old gods lie buried, world-blessing, world-loving, beside the monuments of old-world maligners, for even churches and gods' graves do I love, if only heaven looketh through their ruined roofs with pure eyes. Sadly do I sit like grass and red poppies on ruined churches. Oh, how could I not be ardent for eternity, and for the marriage ring of rings, the ring 
of the return. Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman whom I love. For I love thee, O eternity. For I love thee, O eternity. If ever a breath, the aid of breath, and of the heavenly necessity which compelleth even chances to dance star dances, if ever I have laughed with the laughter of the creative lightning to which the long thunder of the deed followeth grumblingly but obediently, if ever I have played dice with the gods at the divining table of the earth so that the earth quaked and ruptured and snorted forth fire streams, for a divining table is the earth, and trembling with new creative dictums and dice casts of the gods. Oh, how could I not be ardent for eternity, and for the marriage ring of rings, the ring of the return? Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman for whom I love. For I love thee, O eternity. For I love thee, O eternity. If ever I have drunk, a full draught of the foaming spice and confection bowl in which all things are well mixed. If ever my hand hath mingled the furthest with the nearest, fire with spirit, joy with sorrow, and the harshest with the kindest. If I myself am a grain of the saving salt which maketh everything in the confection bowl mix well. For there is a salt which uniteth good with evil, and even the evilest is worthy as spicing and as a final overfoaming. Oh, how could I not be ardent for eternity, and for the marriage ring of rings, the ring of the return? Never yet have I found a woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman whom I love. For I love thee, O eternity, for I love thee, O eternity. If I be fond of the sea, and all that is sea-like, and fondest of it, when it angrily contradicteth me, if the exploring delight be in me, which impelleth sails to the undiscovered, if the seafarer's delight be in my delight, if ever my rejoicing hath called out, the shore hath vanished, now hath fallen from me the last chain. The boundless roareth around me, far away sparkle from me space and time. Well, cheer up, old heart. Oh, how could I not be ardent for eternity, and for the marriage ring of rings, the ring of the return? Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman, whom I love. For I love thee, O eternity. For I love thee, O eternity. If my virtue be a dancer's virtue, and if I have often sprung with both feet into golden emerald rapture, if my wickedness be a laughable wickedness, at home among rose banks and hedges of lilies, for in laughter in all evil present, but it is sanctified and absolved by his own bliss. And if it be my Alpha and Omega that everything heavy shall become light, every body a dancer, and every spirit a bird, and verily that is my Alpha and Omega, oh, how could I not be ardent for eternity and for the marriage ring of rings, the ring of the return? Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman whom I love, for I love thee. O eternity, for I love thee, O eternity. If ever I have spread out a tranquil heaven above me, and have flown into mine own heaven with mine own pinions, if I have swum playfully in profound luminous distances, and if my freedom's avian wisdom hath come to me, thus, however, speaketh avian wisdom, lo, there is no above and no below. Throw thyself about, outward, backward, thou light one. Sing, speak no more. Are not all words made for the heavy? Do not all words lie to the light ones? Sing, speak no more. Oh, how could I not be ardent for eternity? And for the marriage ring of rings, the ring of the return. Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman whom I love. For I love thee, O eternity. For I love thee, O eternity. Fourth and last part. Ah, where in the world have there been greater follies than with the pitiful? And what in the world hath caused more suffering than the follies of the pitiful? Woe unto all loving ones who have not an elevation which is above their pity. 
Thus spake the devil unto me once on a time. Even God hath his hell. It is his love for man. And lately did I hear him say these words, God is dead. Of his pity for man hath God died. Zarathustra, Part 2, The Pitiful. 61. The Honey Sacrifice. And again passed moons and years over Zarathustra's soul, and he heeded it not. His hair, however, became white. One day when he sat on a stone in front of his cave and gazed calmly into the distance, one there gazeth out on the sea and away beyond sinuous abysses. Then went his animals, thoughtfully round about him, and at last set themselves in front of him. O oh, Zarathustra, said they, Gazest thou out, perhaps, for thy happiness? Of what account is my happiness? answered he. I have long ceased to strive any more for happiness. I strive for my work. Oh, Zarathustra, said the animals once more, that sayest thou, as one who hath overmuch of good things, liest thou not in a sky-blue lake of happiness? Ye wags, answered Zarathustra, and smiled. How well did ye choose the simile? But ye know also that my happiness is heavy, and not like a fluid wave of water. It presseth me, and will not leave me, and is like molten pitch. Then went his animals again, thoughtfully around him, and placed themselves once more in front of him. O oh, Zarathustra, said they, it is consequently for that reason that thou thyself always becometh yellower and darker, although thy hair looketh white and flaxen. Lo, thou sittest in thy pitch. What do ye say, mine animals? said Zarathustra, laughing. Verily, I reviled when I spake of pitch. As it happeneth with me, so is it with all fruits that turn ripe. It is the honey in my veins that maketh my blood thicker and also my soul stiller. So will it be, O Zarathustra, answered his animals, and pressed up to him. But wilt thou not today ascend a high mountain? The air is pure, and today one seeth more of the world than ever. Yea, mine animals, answered he, ye counsel admirably, and according to my heart. I will today ascend a high mountain, but see that honey is there ready to hand, yellow, white, good, ice-cool, golden comb honey. For know that, when aloft, I will make the honey sacrifice. When Zarathustra, however, was aloft on the summit, he sent his animals home that had accompanied him, and found that he was now alone. Then he laughed from the bottom of his heart, looked around him, and spake thus. That I spake of sacrifices and honey sacrifices, it was merely a ruse in talking, and verily a useful folly. Here, aloft, can I now speak freer than in front of mountain caves and anchorites' domestic animals. What to sacrifice? I squander what is given me, a squanderer with a thousand hands. How could I call that sacrificing? And when I desired honey, I only desired bait and sweet mucus and mucilage, for which even the mouths of growling bears and strange sulky evil birds water. The best bait, as huntsmen and fishermen require it, for if the world be as a gloomy forest of animals, and a pleasure ground for all wild huntsmen, it seemeth to me rather, and preferably, a fathomless rich sea. A sea, full of many-hued fishes and crabs, for which even the gods might long, and might be tempted to become fishers in it, and casters of nets. So rich is the world in wonderful things, great and small, especially the human world, the human sea. Towards it do I now throw out my golden angled rod and say, Open up, thou human abyss. Open up and throw unto me thy fish and shining crabs. With my best bait shall I allure to myself today the strangest human fish. My happiness itself do I throw out into all places far and wide. Twixt orient, noontide, 